Welcome everyone back to Pommy and Oz. Hope we're all doing really well. If you're new around here, make sure you hit that like button, hit that subscribe. We are smashing them out and I can't thank you enough for that. If you want to become a member, we're doing a live stream. We'll do it Sunday next week for the members only. Um, Carlton have got a game Friday, so Sunday will be a good game to chill out, kick back and enjoy ourselves and look at the week ahead. And we should have a good lay of the land of what finals is looking like at that point as well with some good games this weekend that could give us a knowledge of where we are in the eights. So if you want to do that, link is in the description to do that. It's a cup of coffee. And we're here to talk about Carlton's game versus the Eagles, which um, was a mixed affair, really, even though we won. A lot to take out of that game. Um, firstly, let's just talk about that game. An absolute phenomenal performance from the Blues, it has to be said. The Blues went into that game strong, strong favourites. And they, they they dominated and also had the luxury of playing the second half almost like a training just to run it out. And when they did look a bit threatened, you saw the skill level of Carlton, even with most of our players out, how much strong they were. And that was a really good sign because I don't think I've seen that from the Blues even when we played the Eagles before, that level of control where last year, last last time we played, I found the second half, we didn't really learn anything. It was just Hail Mary football. Eagles almost gave up. The second half here, I really enjoyed, even though it was boring to watch, was the level of control, which you're never going to have it as easy as you probably did this weekend. But, the way that they controlled the ball, held the ball, played keepy off is will hold them in good stead when they play a Collingwood, when they play a Melbourne, when they play in the finals, should they get there? Because you've got to be able to do that at certain stages of the game. Take the heat out of the game and stem it. And that is probably the one question mark of this side that we haven't seen them tested in this five-week period of what happens when they hit the lead and the team comes back hard and the lead isn't 40 and 50. We saw Port do it when Carlton were well ahead and they did hold it off pretty well. They kept that lead and that's what you're looking for. You're looking to go tit for tat. It's going to be interesting to see when you're playing a real rambustious side like Collingwood this week coming up. Can they do that? Can they do that? And this was a good practice. Now, few injuries. Walsh, at this stage of recording, we don't know. We can only presume by going off body language. Out of the three that were hurt, him, Jay Soss and Motlock, he looked the most happy. Whether that means a week or two weeks, Hammy's genuinely, when you've even got a minor one, there's no such thing as a minor soft tissue. It usually is a week, bare minimum, even Walsh superhuman. Is that mind games, though, from Carlton? We know Port are masters of mind games. Um, is that a mind game? Was he totally fine? And they just shelved him because he had a tweak. And it's just a stiff one, which is like Chera, which would be a week's rest effectively only played a quarter, so he's got that rest. Short turnaround, that's going to be a question because Walsh was so dominant in this game, but the Blues were supreme. 97 points from clearances. It's the most by any side this season. It's in the top five of all time. That's insane. Do you know what I mean? That is insane. Charlie Kerno with 10 goals. Um, the Blues as well, their ability to turn the ball over in the front half of the ground as well was incredible. Cowton are literally the number one side now from scores from turnover as well, um, which is insane when they were 16th at the step before this run. That's a huge improvement, and their off-ball running at the moment is insane. And as you can see here from this graph that we've brought up, the kick-to-ball, hand-ball ratio has pretty much stayed the same throughout the season. The tackles, um, there wasn't a huge difference in disposals, believe it or not, this game. They actually had more touches than us. Cowton's tackles, though, was insane. And they came out of this game, which really impressed me, just from the opening bounce, was their willingness to really bully and stifle. And it was almost like they were playing part in their mindset. There was none of this, oh, they're a crap side, let's just wait for them to turn over. We talked about it in the preview. Eagles are the worst side at unforced turnovers, and Cowan just brought that heat, which made that even worse for them. Tackles inside 50, the nine. Maybe a bit shy of where I'd like it. The pressure act numbers are astronomical, but still a positive because a lot of them were marked. 74.4% of inside 50s became rebound 50s. 
tail of the tape. And that has been consistent over the last six weeks, really, for the boys um, since that Gold Coast game. So the last five, their ability to get it out, that was consistent early on. But what is important of this rebound rate is their ability to turn it into something else, not just get it out. And their backline movement is really, really good at the moment. Mid marks inside 50, 20% of them have been marked. That's giving you better scoring shots at goal, a lot deeper entries as well, not in that unguarded area, which, incidentally, a lot of inside 50s against were that count and are giving that up now because they don't care. They know that it's a hard scoring shot. The Hines now are turning into score launches for the Blues. Massive contested and clearance differential. As you would expect, the boys bullied them. And their midfield is probably their strongest area on paper, really. And Carlton had a lot of guys that probably haven't been in the top five, apart from Walsh, this year. Seeing that change around and everyone enact that role. Paddy Dow, George Hewitt really stepped up this game. That's really interesting. 60% goal accuracy. If you can go at that, you're laughing. Chance creation, 60% of inside 50s became something which is really important. And that is huge. The TPI, on average, Cowton's players were 33% better than their opposite. If you can do that, you are laughing. So let's look at some players. We're doing it a bit differently. So please give me feedback on how you like this. We're trying to change it up and find... A real nice, happy complimentary. There is so many Carlton podcasts. I want to add my flair, but also make it a bit more aesthetically pleasing and also a little bit more knowledge pleasing and a point of difference as opposed to me just sat here telling you my thoughts. Um, try and back it up with something. So let's look at TDK. I thought TDK's game was absolutely awesome um, this week. And I am really enjoying TDK's attitude since that Gold Coast game. Um He's really earning them contract dollars. He really is. And he's now becoming into a conversation of, fuck, we can't lose him. Uh, 68 rug contests, 36.8% hit outs won, 44% to advantage. Now, these are the key numbers that I'm really impressed with TDK. And this is what I'm not bothered about his rook work per se. I'm worried about him dominating around the ground. And again, this is another tricky matchup. Bailey Williams is an oath. And these are the ones that traditionally TDK to struggle with. And I'm really enjoying the Matty Cruiser approach to Rookcraft from TDK. And what I mean by that is how he's making the opposite Rookman play his game. And this is a show of maturity, show of maturity, but also a show of him evolving as a footballer. The ground ball gets strong for a Rookman, five. Six marks around the ground. He, he tore Bailey Williams a new one around the ground, let's be honest. These are key. Five tackles, nine clearances. A lot of these clearances taking it straight from the Rook contest. Genius. That is where his strength is, and that translates into the score launches. <clears throat> Very understated stat. And when you do this with Pitt and that, the Rook numbers will be fat town. The rest will be dire. And these are really key. Five score launches, eight score involvements, and the two intercept posies as well. His work rate off the, off the ball is insane. This was a really, really good game from TDK, and it's not been talked about enough. A really, really strong game, especially when you're, you're losing Cripper and Chera. <clears throat> you're looking to your Ruckman, and let's be honest, 10 weeks ago, you would have been like, oh, fuck. Now, TDK is becoming a midfielder. Their numbers, when we get to the midfielders, fairly tasty for a mid. So he's really adding that to his game, and he's really starting to be a benefit of the confidence that's blown at the Blues. An absolute phenomenal game from TDK. Sam Doherty, probably for me, if it wasn't for Charlie Colonel's 10, the best on the ground quite easy. Stepped into that Crips role and the Cherry role. A plum. Absolute a plum. 12 contested possessions. Eight tackles. The one score on, she was happy to be. The beneficiary for other people to create them opportunities of attack. Rebound 50s, as you can see, really down because he played a lot of midfield time. Look at that. 12 inside 50s, nine clearances, 19 metres gain. Cowton was suddenly really direct. And what has impressed me is you take out the players we lost in that midfield. They're not massive metres gain players with the exception of Chera. They're more feeding it on. The fact that we had Dow and Dog, they are very big meters game players when they're playing well. They had to go more direct, which then put pressure on the high half forward line. But 
That ad adaptation hasn't been talked about because, okay, it's the Eagles, but it's all about learning this game when you're playing shit sides, not beating them up. They have learned there that they have another avenue to go from the clearances, which is why they were so astronomically high because the meters gained from them situations was insane. And players that probably will get criticised, Ollie Hollands, his defensive work, insane this week, which then opened up the door for the halfbacks to attack and get into the game. And that is really, really understated as well with them. Just them positional shifts that were really, really subtle. Oli Hollands, I'm not saying he had a great game, but what he did have is a very good game for the system because defensive numbers are astronomical and his ability to add something. And Doc was one of these guys that, for me, was close to best on ground. Charlie Kerner, 85%, 86, we'll round it up. One-on-ones, one, insane. His ability to bring the ball to ground as well was insane. He's going to really thrive playing in a one-key forward system because what he's shown is, yeah, you can outnumber him, but few players his size can go with him, right, and do what he does. And he found space where there was none. Eight marks, three on the lead, five of them contested, seven of them inside 50. Insane numbers, insane numbers. And it's interesting that, it wasn't a target that is astronomically different to what he's experienced when he's with Harry. Then, then percentages of target haven't really changed. But he's learning to adapt his role. And that is dangerous because it's bringing players in. And you can't ignore him. So it, they're always going to be free. 77% goal accuracy is very good. Score involvements, 15, 10 pressure acts. We'd love to see him getting them goal assists. Score involvements, obviously, he was involved in a few chains. He gave one away, which is nice. Understated his shepherding to allow players to get in front of him as well. Very selfless from Charlie. And um, easily free brown votes and easily the best on ground. Georgie Hewitt had a big job. And I said earlier that I don't worry about Georgie Hewitt because I think he'll hit his straps at the back end. And this was a really good game for him to do that, in my opinion. 13 contested marks, two tackles. Four score launches from them stoppages. Incredible. The rebound 50s, again, doing a lot of midfield work where we've seen him have higher numbers and higher behind the ball. More of his traditional role. Six inside 50s, the 10 clearances. Insane. The 15, just under 50 metres clearance metres per game, which is what we're expecting from George. He's he, he's a cog. He's, he's a metronome type player. The 22 pressure acts of the nine ground ball gets. This was huge for me because with no cripper there, this guy gets ridiculous numbers. They had to step up. And him and Doc taking it in turns to do the Cripper job was insane. And the 10 score involvements was a really solid game. And Cripper, for me, was enjoying himself watching this because he saw his usual guys who were his backup really have a good game. A guy that will probably not get enough kudos, but I thought was splendid, was Ching Cotter. And he's a guy that's really built growing on me. Um, took his goal well, was involved in just about everything as well. And I want you to see some roles. Jordan Boyd was a big loss, right? And it was interesting that Chincotta got Boyd's job, Cowan got Chincotta's job, right? So that's really interesting. In a structural point of view, I like it. I like Chincotta having a little bit more opportunity to get ahead of the ball and get into that. And we saw him being played as that extra behind the stoppage, which Voss is really enjoying. And I like Jim Cotter's role here. The 12 disposals, the three tackles, the nine defensive pressure acts, really solid. Seven intercept possessions. He was a real handful around them stoppages. You saw him a lot. Use his high IQ and see that handball, run in and steal it. Three ground ball gets, three score launches, 6.5 metres gain. So this is what I'm talking about. He was really, really key in winning that ball back, just doing the short stuff, retaining possession keep the chains moving. And this is a really understated role. Boyd, Chincotta playing it now. It's a real unforgiving role because it's going to be a game that if you are a guy that looks at data and you don't get the picture and try and see what that data is telling you, and you just look at it at core value, you'll be like, shit game. But look at that, disposal efficiency 100%. That is where we want. So this guy here is literally sacrificing his offensive skill to make sure that the ball is always retained. Now, if you go back to round six, this disposal efficiency would have been about 40%. because, And then the meters gained would have been huge, would have been a lot higher, probably double, because he's not looking to retain possession all of a sudden. He's looking to clear his lines. 
Carlton have had a real change of playing football in the back half of the ground. And remember, Vossi complained about the defence and everyone was saying, what's he on about? This is why modern day football is won in the back half of the ground. That's where you can attack. You're most vulnerable when you're attacking and defences know that. So when you've got a defence like Carlton's that is hard to beat, even when we were shit, makes sense that if you've got cogs there that can win it, have it good. And Chincotta is valuable, really valuable in that role because he's hitting players with good efficiency. He's hitting players like Kemp and McGovern who are willing to take that high-risk pass on. He's hitting players like Walsh in the first who are looking to pivot and make something happen. So Chincotta, thankless task defensively and a very key metronome. Paddy Dow, we finally saw him play a full game. And some people are going to criticise him, right? So let, let, let's talk about the elephant in the room. His disposal efficiency was, was garbage, right? On paper, it's poor, right? And that's fair enough, right? You can't argue it. Contested possessions, though, 11, pretty strong. Two tackles, don't mind it, because he's playing a more negating role in the terms of that his defensive responsibilities. In this, he was more of the offensive player, right? Score launch is one, one rebound 50. So very one way. He, we're looking at his attacking stats here now. Inside 57 clearance is really strong from Dowie. And this is really key. 27.1 metres game per touch. That's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. So a lot of his kicks were, were dangerous kicks. A lot of his... A lot of his usage, although you're looking at it that poor, they're danger field territory because what he's doing is looking to get the ball into that forward half of the ground. And I talked about this when we talked about Dow in the VFL. When your forward line is putting the pressure on that it is, that's grouse, right? Because they're going to make something happen. That's getting to Kernow territory. The boys are around him. Smash, smash, smash. You're creating repeat stoppages in danger areas. And it's interesting that Dow's kicks were in high-risk areas to high-risk zones. That's really hard to do. And it's okay criticising him. But he's kind of played the Chera role here. And he's probably lacked the defensive skills that you get from Chera, which is fair enough, right? Because he was that extra around the stoppages. But Chera doesn't get them metres gained per touches, right? Chera doesn't have that penetration because Chera looks for more craftier kicks, which is, makes him probably a better player, right? Well, he is a better player, but it makes him probably a better player for this role, is what I'm trying to say. But this wasn't a bad gig. Six ground ball gets, 14 pressure acts, six score involvements. As that ex auxiliary midfielder, which when everyone's fit, they will be, and they'll float it, he's probably his issue is Doc did so well in the midfield. So now with Walsh out, you are probably thinking Cripps comes back in. That shows the defensive up. Chera comes back in. That adds a dynamic in the attack. And maybe that means that Dow probably will be stiff and be the sub. But excellent game from him. Excellent game. And it's going to be interesting how they do that because I don't want to see Doc go the back half. I actually think in the midfield, this is the game to be won next week in this midfield. And if Doc can replicate that, that just adds another string. And this guy won't get a bit of love. It was easy to pick on Weter in because he was sensational. But Kemp has really impressed me. And Voss has given him more and more trust in them hard times. And it's paying fruits now the boys are playing well. 11 marks, incredible from Brody Kemp. Four of them intercept, two of them contested. 100% one-on-one. Five intercept marks. The no score launches, which is interesting, right? But this is because he's playing a real... Real negating role as well. So strong defensively. 13.7 metres gain, which is nice. The eight spoils is really good as well because he's got an advantage over McGovern that no one talks about. McGovern is a mark first type player, a bit like Mackay, right, in the forward line. Kemp is a bit like Kerner in the back line. He's also thinking long term. So when he sees it, he's willing to bring this ball to deck. He's willing to pull out of the mark and make sure he does his job first not doing it. And I like this level of maturity. Kemp, for me, has really impressed me as the weeks have gone on. Three tackles have been really good as well. He doesn't mind playing against them smaller boys and hurting them. One of them tackles was on Petrocelli, and that was impressive for me because Petrocelli can burn him. He's got the closing speed as well to hurt these smalls as well. 
It's kind of like having a huge upgrade on how we used to play Locky Plowman three years ago. It's really impressive. And the two score involvements. And I really enjoyed his game. And all in all, I was really happy with what I saw this week from the boys. I thought the boys were really strong. And now it's the big one coming up. They've had five weeks of learning against different systems and their systems matching up against Port will be a big one for them because they know that. And now it's about you've gained your respect. You go in to Port and you really take your respect. The final hurdle is Collingwood really in this development because suddenly psychologically you're right last year mentally. You've got it back. You've beaten all the good sides this year because when people say who can't and beat, Port and Collingwood, if they beat Collingwood, are the two best sides in the comp, without a shadow of a doubt. And then they've got a great matchup with GWS at the end of the year, who at the moment are one of the form teams in the comp. So some real good mindset. Going into Collingwood, more of the same gentlemen, really carry this momentum. And you know what? I think it'll be closer than a lot of people give Carlton credit for, whatever the outs are. This is a side that's playing with confidence and energy. It's incredibly proud to watch them at the moment. So that's the review. Let me know what you think of it. Look after yourselves. I'll see you tonight on the rating show and the Monday show. Much love. Pom out. Rolling up over black Cadillac High heel boots and a sexy body full of tats Baby's bad, oh baby's hella bad